Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the first session in track three for today. I hope you are all feeling extremely energized. Are we all energized? Great, because you're going to need it. This is going to be a hugely interactive session. I've been excited about uh, chairing this one ever since Shannon and I first got to speak a few weeks ago. This is going to be a fun session. Really hope you enjoy it. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce probably the person with the best job title at this conference today, um, Chief Learning Rebel from Learning Rebels. Please welcome Shannon Tipton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, good morning. Or, yes, good morning. It is morning. It's morning where I'm from. I know that for sure. Okay, so how many of you have been to Chicago? Woo! All right, jazz hands for Chicago, absolutely, yes. Uh, and I love always coming out here to London. It's one of my favorite places in the world, so thank you for having me back. I very much appreciate that. So, micro learning, right? That's what we're here to talk about. Well, as he said, my name is Shannon Tipton, and the thing here about micro learning is that it may be small, but it still deserves a plan. Little things still deserve to have a plan. And what I do for a living is that I work with other companies, and I essentially take apart their curriculum and put it back together with micro learning elements. So it's always interesting to be able to go through this experience because I don't know about you, but you've probably been to a number of sessions or even visited the expo area where somebody somewhere was talking about micro learning, right? Can I see the hands? Okay, so can I see the hands of you going, I still don't know what they're talking about? <laughs> yeah, okay, right. You know, and I get it, and that's the same thing. I see this everywhere, and I've been working in the micro learning space now for two and a half years or so exclusively. And I still get this reaction. You know, what, it, what is it? What's it all about? How am I supposed to use it? How does it fit within my organization? Are those the sorts of questions that you're struggling with right now? No, okay. So, first off, usually what happens is I get, where are the slides? How can I get the slides? Okay, well, let's get that question out of the way, okay? So, <laughs> Uh, either scan the QR code, and what this is going to do is this is going to take you to a Slack space. How many of you are familiar with Slack? All right. It's going to ask you for your email address, and that's okay. Don't worry. I'm not going to you know, send you any obnoxious newsletters or anything. Um, but it's going to log you into my Slack channel. And within that, not only are you going to get the presentation, but you're going to get all of the resources associated with this presentation. How about that? Who's your buddy? <laughs> Okay, so I, I don't hide anything. So you've got, uh, within this area, you've got a content outline. You also have a framework outline for this workshop. You have a video checklist, a podcast checklist. You have all sorts of yummy resources that go along with this. All right, so um, everybody got it? Awesome. Now. If you're in that Slack channel, you may have, or a Slack uh, workspace, you may have noticed a variety of different channels there. So I have a channel, and this will be fun. I, I would be um, interested in looking at this as we move along. Is there is a channel there for notes? So, how many people would you, Andy? How many people would you say are in this room? Okay. So wouldn't it be fun to do a little bit of collaborative note taking? And so we can do this on this Slack channel. So within there, if you open up the one channel that says wow notes, you can just feel free to type ahead. Okay. So we are already crowd casting information, which can be used later on if I wanted to build a micro learning element out of it. Also within there, you'll, so you have the resource section, which is where you find all the information. You have the wow notes section for you to take collaborative notes. There's also an area there for pictures. So for those of you who like to use your phones as a note taking device and you wanna take pictures of my slides, I'm okay with that by the way. But you can upload those pictures in that channel. So everyone can see what fabulous pictures you took. 
How cool is that, right? So we're already starting out with you guys putting some information together that you can use later to help you hopefully build something. And that is the essence of microlearning. Okay. So this is just one of the tools that I'm gonna show you today. Later on, I'm gonna show you another one. We're gonna take some polls and we're gonna do some Q and A's in another, um, in another area. So I'm gonna move away from this. So this is your last chance. Well, maybe not last chance. Everybody good? Thumbs up? Right on, all right. So when we think about micro, we think, well, micro learning, trend, or fad. So when you think about things like micro brews uh, in the States, micro breweries are uh, a hot thing. You know, little, little pub-like places, little corporations building their own little unique beer. Micro brews. Trend. And I think that trend's gonna stay with us for a while. Everybody loves a good beer. I know I do. Okay. So, microgreens, restaurants. I don't know if you've seen it. I don't know if it's big out here, but I don't know. I can't go into a restaurant anymore without somebody putting a little piece of green something on my plate. Like a little micro cilantro or micro parsley or something like that. Fat, for sure. Then you think, okay, so we got little greens, little beers. I know, right? Right, little pigs. I saw this picture and I said, I have to build a presentation just around this picture. What can I do to build a presentation around this picture? So we have little micro pigs, little teacup pigs, a little, little, little stuff. And we can all agree that micro means little. However, when I ask people about microlearning, like I did this morning with you, then this is typically what I get. I get this face. I, I don't know. I don't know what it is and what it's supposed to mean. Well, I'm not here to tell you precisely what microlearning is, but I will give you a roundabout definition. Okay. So my roundabout definition here is microlearning is short bursts of focused, right-sized content to help people achieve a specific outcome. In other words, microlearning is supposed to help people do their jobs. We want people to be able to do their jobs smarter, better, faster. And that's all anybody wants to be able to do. And so in order to do something smarter, better, faster, it doesn't necessarily require an eight-hour workshop or a three-hour e-learning course or even watching a one-hour video. So the, the issue here, or the question becomes, how do we get it into that right-sized focus space? Right. So that's what we're going to talk about. How many of you have seen this? Anyone familiar with this? Oh, awesome, okay. Now, so this was created, Bernson by Deloitte, created this infographic, okay. Infographic, here is another example of a micro-learning object. This is, is it a word, Googleable? If not, it is now, okay. You can, go, you can go online, you can Google this. This is in the public domain. And this is who we are as modern learners today. Now there are a couple of statistics that I'm going to pull out of this to talk to you about. First off is this one. Two out of three workers complain that they don't have time to do their jobs. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, we can all relate to that. So two out of three workers complain they don't have time to do their jobs. Then you put this all together with facts like tech turnover is two and a half years. That means that the technology that you are implementing within your organizations right now is going to be obsolete in two and a half years. I would challenge that. I would say it's less. How often are you changing out your cell phones right now or your mobiles? Every two years? Some of you, if you own an Apple device, Apple has gotten us trained to change our phones every year or so, and that's because information technology becomes obsolete. 
Well, then that means the life of professional skills is anywhere from two and a half to five years. So because the time is shrinking with technology training, that means then that our professional skills is also shrinking. So that means then that the knowledge that I'm giving you right here, right now, is going to be obsolete in two and a half years. You need, we're going to have to come back. Let's make a date. Everybody put it in their calendars. We'll be back here again in two and a half years to talk about this. But again, it says five. I shouldn't even put five up there because I don't think it's that long. I think that the way the rate of speed of information today is just way faster than that. If you have curriculum that's sitting on your shelves that's five years old, you got dust bunnies on it. So it's time to take it off, dust it out, and refurbish it. Then we've got people spend 21% of their time just looking up stuff. So you're spending 20 minutes out of every 100 on Google or on your intranet or on SharePoint or searching your emails for something. So you're spending about 21% of your day just looking up stuff. <laughs> then when you think about this, you spend 41% of your time doing things that don't help you in your day-to-day. -day. Meetings, conference calls, those extended conversations in the hallways. All of these things are getting in the way of you doing your day-to-day. All right, so here's the thing. In North America alone, we spend $160 billion, that's with a B, $160 billion on learning and development. That's a lot of change. That's a lot of microbrew. However, fewer than 15% of workers apply that formal training to their day-to-day. absorb that one. Spending $160 billion on training and we're only using 15% of it. Not really a statistic I might show my boss. We'll keep that in between, this, between us. But this means then that concepts like microlearning really become critical. This is why I'm showing you this right now because this is the why behind it. We intuitively already know that short bursts of training is an important thing to do just simply to manage your people's cognitive load. However, when we put it in context of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, it even becomes more critical to know that people don't have time. So if they're only uh, taking 15% of your $160 billion and doing something with it, that means that what they're getting out of formalized training today is simply not helping them. They need help. Our jobs as adult educators is to help people do their jobs. And this is where microlearning is going to help all of us. So let's get down to it. What is it? Well, maestro. See, I've, I've, I've got a guy. <laughs> Okay, I'm super excited. I've got a guy to help me with this. So I'm going to put up a poll here. We're going to do, I'm going to show you another tool. Right here. Okay, so this is a tool called UMU. And UMU is a, it's actually a micro learning platform. But today I'm going to use it for polling purposes. So if you will go to umu.com and you enter in pin 218532 and then click join session, a poll will show up. So you can access this from your phones, you can access it from your tablets or if you've got your laptops open. Takes a little while, get you guys logged in. So you should be seeing a poll, and that poll is going to ask you what sort of micro-learning tools are you currently using in the workplace? So 
So you're going to umu.com. Oh, there's somebody's in. Okay. Umu.com. You're entering the PIN 218532, clicking Join Session, and the poll should appear. I'm sorry. It's asking if it has to create an account, but it no, says Join Session. No, you don't have to create an account. Just click Join Session. <coughs> Some, a few people have gotten in. You're not able to get in? No. It, the, the connection's slow? Okay. Pardon me? Went in for you, no problem? Okay, so it could be we're having an, oh, whoop, oh. Okay, all of a sudden everybody went poof. Okay. <laughs> three That's right. Went from three to seventy-three. All right. Everybody's in all at the same time. Awesome. That was funny. Okay. We'll give it. Uh, I'll probably give it about ten or fifteen more seconds, and we'll see what else comes flying on in. Okay, I'm going to give it another 15 seconds. We'll see if we can't hit that magic. Oh, 100! I need to figure out who's like the 100th person and then give them a prize or something. That would be fun. All right, let's let's see what we let's see what we got there. All right. Okay. So, have you created micro learning objects within your organization? We've got 79% of you saying yes, that's <laughs> fabulous. We've got 11% of you saying no, and that's okay, that's why we're here. And then we have the predictable people who are like, I just don't know. I could be, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it is, it might be, and that's all right. So then, what is it that you're creating? All right, so you can see this here. We've got most of you, and this is not a shocker. It's not a shocker to see that most of you are creating some sort of video. Hopefully they're short ones. We're gonna talk about chunking videos in a second. So we've got videos, we've got uh, the next part, our job aids. Third, recorded webinars, then screencasting, and that's with tools like Screencast-O-Matic or Camtasia something along those lines. Then we've got um, recorded PowerPoints is next. We got some, oh, I, I always get excited to see podcasting. Who's doing podcasting? That's awesome. Podcasting underutilized tool. We'll talk about that as well. And some recorded, some people are doing recorded lectures. So now with the others, let's see what, um, see what we've got here with others. Some animations, some infographics, interactive PDFs. Thumbs up to that. How-to guides. So how many of you were surprised to see job aids on the list? Okay, a few. All right, less than I thought. Usually people are surprised to see job aids as a micro-learning tool. But they are. So if we go back to the very beginning and we talked about helping people do their job smarter, better, faster, job aids fall into that category. Infographics, decision trees, checklists, wallet cards, all of those things count as a micro-learning object, not necessarily a course per se, but an object that counts. All right, so 
We've got explainer videos. That's good. That's probably something like Go Animate or My Simple Show or Powtoon, something along those lines. Uh, flip cards. Emails with, oh, who is that? Emails with one, nice. Gold star for you. We call it an apple a day. An apple a day. OK, everyone should be stealing that. You should write that down. OK, so lovely. Perfect. OK, a Lego stop motion animation. Who's doing that? <laughs> OK, yes, that's awesome. Uh, I worked with an organization, and we did stop motion animation for safety videos. Because we had, to, we had to think about how are we going to globalize it, right? And you can do stop animation videos without audio and still get your message across. Similar? OK. So you can do those in short, and those become micro learning elements as well. So that's super cool. Let's see. What else we got? PDF fact sheets, audio podcasts, <laughs> infographics, LMS modules. OK, we'll talk about how that fits in. Tip sheets, small repetitive quizzes. So anyone here um, have have you read um, Make It Stick? Okay, <coughs> hands, make it stick. Another thing you should be writing down right now, make it stick. I can't think of the author's name right now, but that's the title of the book. And what they talk about there is spaced learning. And the importance of spaced learning through appropriate types of quizzes, tests, et cetera. So not the punitive type where people get in trouble if they fail, but one to ensure spaced learning and repetitious learning, all to manage people's cognitive load. All right, games and pictures, great. Apps, awesome. So if you'll bring me back to my presentation, that'll be great. This is Jamie. Everybody say hello, Jamie. Hey. Wave. <laughs> OK, Jamie is lovely. Thank you very much for your help, sir. OK, so now we know what you're doing. And you know that you're doing some things very well. And this is great. And this is where I wanted to level set the room, is to see, have you all look at each other and go, yes, I'm doing it. OK, so now let's talk about some of the guidelines, if you will, around it. Now you can sort of sense check your own work. So we're going to, I'm going to show you six different markers of what makes a micro-learning um, object element. First off, it's short effort. So that means it shouldn't be taking you a long time to do. <clears throat> Typically what happens is that you've got a business sponsor knocking at your door, and they say, I need training yesterday. Does that sound familiar? Right? Or I need it tomorrow. And then you say, oh, well, it's going to take me six months. <laughs> well, that answer isn't appropriate anymore. There are some, there are some um, lessons where, yes, that might be what you have to do. But in general, people need help now, not six months from now. So that means that you need to be able to create micro-learning objects, elements, within a short period of time. Um, so it takes you a short effort to uh, to complete, it's a short time for people to consume. Now, the next question I usually get here is, well, how long is that? Three minutes, five minutes, seven minutes? Well, I'm going to frustrate majority of you by telling you there is no specific answer to this. Some of you may be looking for a specific answer. I will tell you this is that there's been studies done by Vimeo as well as by YouTube in accordance to length of video. So they tell us that people generally drop off the interest track at about the three minute mark. Yeah, we've all been there, right? We've all been to YouTube and you, you, you're trying to find out how to cook a steak. And you're not looking for the 20 minute video, are you? No, you're looking for the short one. So about three minutes. But they will also tell us that if the uh, subject is highly relevant and highly important to the viewer, they will hang on for a grand total of seven minutes. OK, seven. Woo! 
So I don't suggest that you go off and create 15-minute videos and call them micro-learning. It's not to say that they're bad videos. They're not. It just may not necessarily apply to what we're talking about here. OK. So <coughs> along with small units then, so we've got short time to consume, small units. What I mean by that is a micro-learning element is one concept, one key idea, no exceptions. That's it. You're only talking about one thing at a time. This is not the space to talk about the backstory. This is not the history lesson. People do not need the history of time in order to tell the time. Okay? So this is not the spot for that. So you've got small unit, short time, short effort, immediate use. So people should be able to use it right then and there. So this means it doesn't have to look purdy. Perfect is not essential. Usability is essential. So they need to be able to use it immediately. The next part of this is flexible modality. So that means then you have to think about who your audience is and how they are going to be using the work. So let me give you a story. Once upon a time, long, long time ago, I used to work for a horticulture organization. And I was their uh, director of learning and development at the time. And came in, did my due diligence, and the plant technicians, and so horticulture, it's a plant company for, co for organizations like this convention center. So they would come in and put the plants in, and put the plants in hotels and that sort of thing, and take care of them. And they had these little workbooks, and they were about so big, you know, pamphlet-sized. Nobody used them. Somebody want to venture a guess as to why they didn't use them? I'm sorry? Yeah, the, that's exactly correct. If you work in plants, what are you working with? Yep, you're working in dirt, you're working in water. So while it might have been a um, while while it might have been a good idea at the time, while it might have been a good idea at the time, in practice it didn't quite work out. And so this is what you have to think about: how are people using it? So this is where it's important to think about the workflow. You have to think about what people's day to day looks like. And then how are they going to take that element and use it to help them do their jobs? So ultimately, what we ended up doing first is that we ended up creating um, a bunch of little cards that were laminated so that they were waterproof. And we attached them to a carabiner so that they could take it with them. Because the other thing I found out upon discovery was that they were only assigned one. They only got one, and that was it. So everybody was scared to use it. They didn't want to get it wet. They didn't want to get it dirty. Uh, that doesn't help anybody. So we need to figure out how it works in the workflow itself. And that was one of the things we did. Ultimately, we turned it into a mobile app where they could scan QR codes to, make, to, to find out information. But your quick fix is just giving them a tool that they can use in that moment. That means then easy access. Microlearning is not buried 10 clicks into your LMS system. Where do businesses go to die? The second page of Google. Where does your training go to die? Five clicks in. That's where they're calling you. They're like, I can't find it. And you're like, well, it's there. Nobody can find it because it's not searchable, you didn't tag it, you didn't put keywords on it. People can't find it. If they can't find it, they won't use it. So it, you have to be able to take into consideration how they're going to access it. In some cases, what this means is it goes on an intranet homepage, or maybe it's an icon on their desktop, or maybe it, it's a mobile app. 
you know, so it's thinking creatively outside of the box. And a lot of times what I hear is, well, if I don't put it in my LMS, how do I track it? <coughs> okay, well, the, my question always back at that is, why do we want to track it? We track things sometimes out of habit because we always do. And so with micro learning, it's a different sort of track. It's not unlike marketers where you're tracking SEO. So what you want to track here are things like clicks and downloads. And then later on, you may want to put out a survey that says, did you find this usable, helpful, et cetera. But there are no tests associated with this. You, you're not giving people a test. You're not having them write an essay. You know, so sometimes because of that, we now have further freedom to take it out of the LMS. So just something for you to ponder and think about. And we can, we'll bring that back to topic here in a little bit. So those are the six markers. How you doing? Everybody okay? Everybody feel good? That's great. Yay, yes. Okay, we're hanging in there. Here's the point I would like to make. The point I would like to make here is that, you know, I've been around the block a time or two. 25, if I were to be honest, without totally giving away my age. And I've seen <coughs> learning and development progress. And that also means that I've seen the participants <coughs> progress. And I remember back in the day, we were calling them students. And then we were calling them participants. And then we were calling them end users. Now we call them learners. OK. Uh, great. I just like to think of them as human. So. I would ask you to have that same mentality. Because when we think of people as people, it changes how we produce work. So what I mean by this is think about your life. Think about how you live today. So when you go online and you run a search for something, most likely, 99.9% .9 of the time, you're going to Google. And our expectation is such that if I type in happy cats, I'm going to get 2.5 bazillion hits. And it's up to me to decide which one I want to look at. However, when we use the search function at work, we get cannot find. Right? <laughs> And that's frustrating to people. People expect stuff to work like it works in life. So our job is not to frustrate the humans within our organization. All right, so if your search engine doesn't work like Google, you're frustrating the humans within your organization. If the discussion boards in your learning management system or in your uh, communication uh, your enterprise social network, if it doesn't work like Facebook, you are frustrating the humans in your organization because they expect to be able to thread. They expect to be able to search. They want to just be able to upload stuff and read stuff. They want it easy. If your videos don't work <coughs> like YouTube, you're frustrating the humans in your organization. So we need to make sure that videos, they can rate them, that they can fast forward, that they can move it back, that they can pause. Too often we want to control things and we want to lock it down. They must watch the whole thing because if they don't, they will die. No, they won't. <coughs> Okay. People are smart. They figure it out. We were just talking about this over dinner the other night. That 
Have you ever gone into YouTube and you found a video that maybe was five minutes and then you, you went straight to the middle of it to find whatever it was that you wanted, right? So you skipped over to like the two minute mark or two and a half minute mark and you went, wait, 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 too far. And then you moved it back because, oh, wait, that, no, I, I guess I need further information. So you moved it back and then you moved it forward, right? It's that whole control mechanism. Humans want control over what they see and do. So who are we to try to control human behavior. I'm telling you, you'll fail every single time. So if you allow the choice to happen and not frustrate the humans within your organization, you'll be better off. So that leads me to my last point is with e-readers. And I saw this on some of the um, other notes that you all put in, searchable, findable PDF files. So if you're gonna create PDF files, they need to work like a Kindle or your Nook, or, or your iPad, or however it is that you're reading nowadays. They, the pages need to be annotatable. They need to be able to highlight. They need to be able to bookmark. They need to be able to click on a word and find the definition. So that means it needs to be hyperlinked. So the, the e-document needs to work like an e-book. And so for those of you who are creating e-books, and I've spoken with a number of people here this week that are doing that, and that's super cool because that's how they should be working. That means you are not frustrating the humans in your organization, you're doing a good job. So, now that we've talked about this, how many of you feel really good that you are not frustrating the humans in your organization? Oh, we got a few hands. Some of you are like, well, that's okay. Again, it's like being in church. It's all between the four walls here. What happens in this room stays in this room. It's all good. All right. So let's talk about what it's not. It's not chunking. This is the largest misconception that I come across, is that microlearning is chunking. Microlearning is not chunking. Chunking means that we are, and this is good learning practice, so don't get me wrong. Chunking is important to managing people's cognitive load. Okay, information going into the front of the head. This is important. However, with microlearning, it's important that it stand alone. I'm gonna show you what that means here in a sec. But when we chunk a piece of information, so your, um, your manager or director or whomever comes to you and says, we have this one hour video, I'd like you to break it into 15 minute parts. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, okay. Uh, would you take this video and chop it into four 15-minute parts, and we'll call that micro-learning? No. Okay. Because what that means then is that I must watch all of the parts. So in order for me to understand what's happening in part two, I must watch part one. Right? And in order for me to continue on to part three, I must watch part two watch part two. That's not what we want to happen here. We want people to be able to lift a piece of training out and be able to use it. Not unlike a bowl of candies. So consider the bowl to be your macro content. So if you're saying sales training, for example, you can have a bowl that is designated for sales training. But the key here is that all of those little candies are independent of each other. I can take one candy out and enjoy that if I wish. But if you're me, that's not me, I'm, I'm like the handful girl. But that aside. <laughs> so I can choose to take that handful or I can choose to take one. Either way, I'm still able to use the learning. It also means then that I have this group of people who took the class I have this group of people who have not taken the class. You guys can still take and participate with the micro-learning and still learn and use from it, even though you are not part of the larger part of the class itself. So it's standalone objects, not chunking, not continuation. As we saw with job aids, right? People are able to use that, they're able to do their jobs. So then that means it's not about tech. Not about technology. And this is the other misconception that I get, is that people think it always has to be video, 
or that it always has to be computer-based. That's not true. It can be low techy techy or high techy techy. It's up to you to make that call. All right. So before I continue, do you have any questions right now? OK. We'll get to, we'll have time for questions as we go throughout. So it is, so now you made the, the light bulb may be going off. You're going, well, how is this different than performance support? It's not. It is performance support. Micro learning is performance support. <coughs> We're helping people do a job better, quicker, faster, smarter. OK. That means then we're trying to solve a problem. So your first question when it comes to microlearning development is, what problem are you trying to solve? That's always your first question. What problem am I trying to solve? So. This leads me to this, and there's further explanation with this in the um, framework that's in the Slack channel. So if you go inside the Slack channel, you're going to see something that's called a microlearning worksheet. And within that, there's elements that work this out for you. So it breaks it into three parts, because this is a subset of a full day workshop. So I'm giving you information on the full day workshop here in an hour. Again, who's your buddy? Right? Me. OK. So we've got the first part is about discover, the discovery process, understanding the who, the why, the what, the how. Then you have the development part that's coming up with your main idea. Remember, <coughs> one key idea. So what's that one key idea? So now it's time to break apart content. This is for you to decide, you know, what's bloat, what's not bloat. Then the next part is you're just deciding on your delivery mechanisms. How are you going to host it? If it is video, where are you going to put it? Most importantly, who's going to maintain it, right? Who's going to be responsible for it? It doesn't have to be you, but it needs to be somebody. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to end up with 100 different little micro-learning objects sitting around that you need to do something with. So again, it goes back to proper keywording, proper tagging, proper archiving. <coughs> so these are the three decisions that you need to make. And like I said, on that framework page, you're going to see I lead you through a series of questions <coughs> for you to answer to help you de to develop some kind of content. Also in that resource section is a, um, a URL for a tool called Session Lab. Sessionlab.com, S-E-S-S-I-O-N-L-A-B.com. And that is an online content development tool. What? Yes, it's fabulous. So you, it allows you, it's dynamic, the boxes move, you can color code things, you can add attachments, and it helps you work out your content outlines. And so you need this even when you're developing little stuff. Like I said, it might be small, it still needs a plan. So if you're not working with content outlines for this, you should be. And that tool will help you do that. So first you're just determining what problem is it that you're trying to solve. The next part is, who's your target audience? <coughs> so again, this is very, very specific. So you may be creating content for um, a super experienced salesperson, and then another set of content for someone who is relatively new. Then you want to decide what is it that people are going to do, and then how are they going to be able to use the content. So remember my example from earlier. So that framework that's in that website will walk you through these questions. Then what content is needed, and how much is bloat. 
So when you think about bloat, do you ever play Jenga? Do you know the game Jenga? Yeah. Okay. So when you think about Jenga, you got a tower. You got a tower of blocks. And think about that tower of blocks like content. Okay. So you got this full thing of content. Your job is to keep taking the blocks out. Keep taking the blocks out until the thing is about to collapse upon itself. Once you get to that point, then you've taken out enough. But if you keep taking out content and the content still makes sense, that means you can continue to take out more. Keep taking out content until it stops making sense. That means then that you have stripped it from all of the bloat. Because this is purely what people need to know. It's not nice to know or should know or eventually should know. It's need to know now. So that's stripping out the bloat. And you want to take a scalpel to this, not a hatchet, but a scalpel. And you're going to shred it out and figure out, OK, what's the lowest common denominator that I need? All right. So here's what it looks like in the end. You've got your main topic, that might be sales. You've got your key takeaway, and then whatever supporting points that you're going to use. This is a relatively fast process. So you're thinking about what is the main topic that I'm trying to get across, then what is that one key takeaway that needs to be included, and you're thinking about maybe three supporting bullets and that's really all that it should be at this point. Anything more than that is going to take you into you know, regular training. So how does this look? Well, it looks like this. You've got a sales process, which might be your main topic. I'm going to teach people about a sales process. But the key takeaway here is to teach salespeople how to generate leads through emails. That's the main idea that I want people to be able to get across. And what does that mean then? So that means that my micro-learning object may be all about how to embed a product video into an email. My one key takeaway is how to embed a product video. That's it. No more, no less. We're not talking about the whole part in the yellow. The main takeaway here is the part in the red or, or the, the burgundy there. So how does it look? It looks like this. So our main key takeaway, they're going, to be, they're going to learn how to embed the video, or they're going to be able to do embed the video. So the needed information that I've determined that needs to go into my micro-learning object is to first remind them how to create an email, how to create a video link, how to embed the code. Now the modality is I'm going to do this through a screencast. I'm going to do it on Camtasia. I'm going to do it on Screencast-O-Matic. And then I'm going to send it out. So the content is driving, if you notice on this up here, the content is driving the modality, not the other way around. I did not say, I want to create a video. Now what can I shove in that video? It's the other way around. What modality is best served for the content? That's, that's the other part of your equation that you need to think about, because not everything is suited for video. If you think about the workflow, right? You think about the workflow. If I'm teaching salespeople stuff, are they going to be watching a video while they're driving? I hope not. OK? So you want to give them something that maybe that they can do. So maybe the screencast is an audio version. I don't know. Or maybe, maybe you're expecting them to watch it while they're at their desk, because that's where they're usually creating email, and that's where they're going to need help. So again, it's about understanding the workflow and how people work naturally and making that work alongside it. So here's how it might work with bigger macro content. So if we're talking about my mac, oops. Uh-oh, come back, OK. So we've got the sales training. That's our macro content. When I say macro, that means large. So this is our large content. 
Now let's say we're going to put people through a week's worth of sales training or a couple of weeks worth of sales training. What we can do is if you take those blue dots, those blue dots can be dropped in. So those blue dots become the little candies that I talked about that support each of these major content elements. But again, I can take those blue dots out and I can give it to this gentleman, kindly sitting here in the front. I can give him this blue dot and he could take that blue dot and work with it. He doesn't have to be part of the bigger picture. So that's one way to think about it. The other way to think about it is like this. This is after the fact. So I recently created this, almost this exact lineup for Zappos, for their customer service people. Their customer service people during new hire orientation would go through these different areas. And then what we did is that we created a series of micro learning <laughs> objects to give them to help them do their jobs. So that way, instead of spending, I kid you not, three weeks in assorted different classes, we were able to take that down to one week with supporting micro learning objects. Now they're doing their jobs better, faster, smarter. It's costing the organization less time, less effort, and people are productive faster. <coughs> and that's really what your organization wants. All right, different tools. Some of you may be familiar with some of these. Certainly not an all-exclusive list. There are many more than, what, eight? <laughs> So you may be familiar with some of them. We've got Video Scribe, which, are tool, which is a tool like Powtoons or Go Animate or My Simple Show. Explain Everything is a tool that works on your mobile device. You've got a mobile device and you can hold it over a picture and then you draw on your mobile device different arrows and you can add text and say point here, do this, do that. Take a snapshot of it at the end and then send it out. Something super cool. Um, Adobe Spark, I apologize ahead of time if there's anybody from Adobe in the room, but it, for once Adobe has created something that's user friendly. <laughs> okay, so Adobe Spark is something that's very clever. It, you can take pictures and create videos out of them. So, and you can do that on your cell phone. Okay, really easy. Canva makes you look like you know what you're doing from graphic design. Uh, and Yumu, which is what we were just using. Yumu, like I said, is a microlearning tool that puts things in packages. So you open up a course, you can create a bunch of little microlearning elements and send it all out to people. They open it up and they have all of these different microlearning things that they can use. And you create it directly within their product mostly on the phone. You can create video and you can create articles and um, audio clips. It's a super cool tool that I highly recommend that you investigate. All right. Now it's your turn. Okay. So we've got a few minutes and here's what I'm going to have you do. And I realize that space is a little close. But I trust that you guys will be able to work within this. So I've got, I got another guy. Yeah, I got another guy. He's going to hand out some paper. And maybe you have some papers within, um, if you've got a, I'm sorry, again, if there are any vendors in the room, um, you may want to take out a vendor place and uh, piece and play with it. What we're going to do is, you guys are going to make me some paper airplanes. Okay, and what I'd like you to do, you don't each need one, so get together with your row, or like you, we got four people right here, that makes like a natural group, and four people right here. Here's what I'd like you to do is, I'd like somebody to go back and think about writing out what, are, what is necessary to create a paper airplane. What's your goal? There might be a couple of goals, right? <laughs> So somebody talk to me. What might be one goal to build a paper airplane? What? To fly. OK, there's the big one. We want it to fly. What might be another goal? Pardon me? 
cheap to make. You might want to make one that's intricate or the prettiest one. Might not fly, but it looks good. Okay? So what I'd like you to do is I want you to create a paper airplane, but here's the other part of it that I would like you to do. Is I want someone to record the effort. Okay? So you guys are going to talk through it. You're going to build it. Now, if you want to, you can go directly into that Slack channel. In there, I've got a channel for your project. So you can type out the instructions there if you wish, or take pictures. You could take pictures of this, and I've had other groups do this, where you take a picture of step one, a picture of step two, a picture of step three, and load that into the Slack channel after you're done. It would be fun to see different sorts of um, elements like that that you guys can go back and look at later. So hold on a second before you start. Before you start, so we're going to do this really quickly. Then we're going to come back and I'm going to answer questions and give you some more information. Okay, so we're not entirely done here, but I want to show you how this works in concept. So somebody needs to be thinking about the goals and somebody needs to be thinking about the steps and somebody needs to be recording the effort. All right, are you ready? I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you five. Five minutes. Let's see how far you are. Yay! That's great. Goal achieved. Goal achieved. And I have you know that you, there were um, airplanes in the air at the three minute mark. I gave you five, remember? And some of you may have went, oh my God, five, what? No, and you managed to get it done. The, the goal here is not to strive for perfection. Your goal was simple. Perhaps in your group was to have one that flew. And we have a variety of, of, different, a variety of different designs here. We've got one with this guy's got a, like a tail, this little Top Gun-ish. And then one that's square and one that's built on your classical like um, triangle shape. So everyone's got a different vision of what success looked like. It didn't matter whether or not we all agreed on a design concept, right? That wasn't important. What was important is that we got the thing in the air and that hopefully you got it recorded and then you put, you know, whoever took the recording, if you uploaded it into the Slack channel, that would be fun for you guys all to watch later. So what happens here is that if, if perhaps you got your plane built and you got your video and you uploaded your video into the Slack channel. Now, if you didn't get your airplane built, it becomes micro learning for you. If you go into the channel and watch all of the other videos about people who managed to get it done. Okay, any of you go to Google to do research? Yeah, that's okay. I didn't say you couldn't, right? So you use micro learning to help you with your micro learning. How meta. Okay, so the point here is that I did want to bring home the fact that don't worry about perfection. Just do it. Just get her done. You know, so you guys can do this. It doesn't take a whole lot. Sometimes it's just a matter of finding out what the goal is and what is it that people needed to do. Then it's a lot easier to do it in a team, isn't it? Because some of you may not be like me. I would still be trying to figure out how to build the thing because I can never get one to fly. So I need somebody with me who's going to help me with that. And maybe somebody had a really good idea about how to take the video. Anyone use pictures instead of video? OK, right? Pictures instead of video. Anyone here just wrote out the instructions? OK, yep, yep, yep. And how many of you actually took video? Yep, OK, yes. So we had a variety of different modalities happening, none of which better or worse than another, but what happened to work for the content? and the context, especially if it were noisy in the room, right? So it might work better to take pictures rather than video if it's super noisy. So those are the decisions that you're going to make. 
So here's the last thing that I wanted to show you real quick. If you go back to the UMU site, so you don't need to, if you just refresh the page, if you happen to still be there on your phone, again, it's enter, you, this is another way that you can enter if you had got to it before. You can go 218532.umu.com. And what you're going to see there now is a um, question and answer. So if you have any burning questions, this is your opportunity to ask them. But I'll take questions from the group as well. So you can ask them on the website. And I will actually, if you've um, downloaded the app in order to ask your question or to take the poll originally, then you'll see my answer. Because I'll go in later and I'll answer all your questions. That's another cool micro learning feature. How cool would it be if your people had access to the subject matter expert? They can ask questions anytime they wanted to ask, and your subject matter expert could answer them. OK, so that's another way to get learning where learning needs to be when you think about it being in the wild, which is where we all are at when we need help. So I'll take a voice question. So anyone want to? Got yes, ma'am. Okay, we use this approach quite often. It's very effective. However, the distinction I would make, and I'm just curious to get your thoughts on, is we do the micro learning and we call it disposable okay. learning because that's the quick ones. Yep. But if we really want it to last a long time and make a real impact, um, we actually take a little more time okay. than it would be. It actually requires more time to make the important information quicker and shorter because, and we script it and we keep it less than 30 seconds in a minute. Do you, do you agree with that? Like there's yep. this bulk is disposable and then the other bulk not so yeah. much. No, I do agree with that because sometimes we do have the luxury of time where IT comes to you and says we're doing a software rollout in six months. So can you deliver something to go along with that? So in that case, you do have the luxury of time. Most of the time, we do not, where they're just knocking at your door saying, we need help right now. So that's where I, I make the point of saying, don't get caught up in analysis paralysis. Just get something done. But yes, absolutely, in your case, if you've got that time, script it out, make your, make your content plans, and make it good. Well, time is a matter of weeks. Yes. Yeah. Right, right. OK? Anyone else? Questions? Okay, do you want to bring that up for me? For me. Thank you, Jamie. Okay. So here's what it um So, there you go. Okay. So, if there were questions, yes, this is what it would it would appear here. And so I would be able to oop, I would be able to scroll through this, and you would also be able to vote up or down the questions based on their popularity. So um, we can go you, we can go back, and I'll leave this open. So if you have questions later on, oh really? Okay. Okay. Now it's on. Oh, so Should I go back? yeah, you can go back if you want. So it was a matter of turning on the display. So we didn't turn on the display. OK. Any other? Yes, ma'am. So I'm all about micro learning, and I totally agree with the concept. Um, my struggle is with maybe the overall architecture, mm -hmm. because finding one message to tackle is easy. But what if you have the whole I don't know, product to train on? I mean, it's, it's hard to do it in quick and, and, and dirty, mm -hmm. right? You need to right. step back and think, and what are the key messages? And it may take a while. Right. So any tips on that or, or thoughts? On uh, that? <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, I take that big rock approach. So if I go back into the presentation, and you start with, first off, thinking about what parts are appropriate for microlearning and what parts are not. Because there are going to, there's going to be times where it's just not appropriate. You know? So if you're doing a product launch, you may need to do 
a, you may need to do a bit of a ramp up, a knowledge base, set the foundation. And then you have other parts that are broken into microlearning elements. So you're going to take that out. And what, one of the brainstorming techniques that I like to use is there's two. So first you can do a hierarchical type of outline where you start at the top. And then each independent piece becomes, goes underneath it. And then you break each of those pieces down into smaller pieces. And the smallest pieces end up being the microlearning elements. Then you can also break it out and brainstorm it in a linear fashion, especially if it's something along the lines of steps. So you can set up a timeline. Um, and I, I used to do this in my office. So I would put like a, a piece of tape on the wall. And on this side starts step one or part one. And then it ends with, and I, you just keep working all the way through it until you get to whatever the last one is, whether it's part, let's say part five. Part five is the end. And so you got part one, two, three, four, five. And each part has its own identifier. And then you just take that down. Part one means this, 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 and this. Part two means that, 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 and that. And again, you go down to the smallest, lowest common denominator and think, that's the one that belongs in microlearning. That there is something that people are going to use right here, right now, to be able to help them to do their job. It could be part of the overall course, but it's also its own standalone object that deserves to be all by itself. So it's a matter of um, you have to shatter it. You got to drop it on the ground and watch it break. And then you put all the pieces back together again. And sometimes it takes a little bit longer at first than you might like. But once you get into the practice of doing it and you use the framework that I gave you, it will help you to break that down into manageable chunks. Okay. And if I had a flip chart page here, I'd be drawn all over it. But fortunately, nobody gave me a marker, so I'm not writing on the walls. So it's all good. All right. Anyone else? Do you, right. did we? Oh, we've got something here. Okay, so let's see what we've got. So this is how it looks. Here we go. Okay. So you can see how this tool works here. And this is something else. You can put this online and people can come in and out of it anytime that you want. So where can I find good examples of micro learning? YouTube. YouTube's the granddaddy of all micro learning. You can also go into, um, if you want to see it from an e-learning perspective, go into the Articulate website. So their e-learning heroes has all sorts of samples. And I would recommend that you start there. So those are two areas. So another, I'll take one more here. Um, how, how to host to have one source of truth. Ooh, that's a probably, that's a whole other class. <laughs> um, what, what your organization uses, try to work within the parameters of what your organization uses. Again, I would not put these things and bury them within your learning management system. So uh, what's really critical are the things that we mentioned before, is regardless of where you put it, be sure, be sure that it's searchable. Be sure that it's key. you've got keywords, you've got tags. It's not a binary search, meaning that they have to put exactly what it is that they're looking for. OK, so those are my tips. I, I, that, that is actually a bigger question than I have time for right now. But I'll go back through here, and I'll, I'll answer some questions on the tool. And then you can be able to go back in and take a look at it. OK, so thank you for Marcus. your time today. I've thank you very much. Thank you.